You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. In 1982, the band Chumba Wumba was formed. You heard that right. It was 15 years before the band found success in the States with their stadium anthem, Tub Thumping. However, the band is way more punk rock than you'd think. This week, I'm joined by Eben Wares of Yellowbird Mantra to decide if Chumba Wumba should have stayed down or if they deserve to get up again on the charts. One hit is all you need To make the money guaranteed And you can live off royalties Forever And it makes me wonder Is it just a wonder Or is it one hit thunder So Evan, you chose Tub Thumper. So right off the bat, I'm going to ask you, do you know what a Tub Thumper is? No idea. Well, I'll tell you right now. It's a speaker or advocate characterized by speech or rhetoric that is passionate, pompous, blustering, etc. Does that make sense? Makes complete sense. Yeah, I guess that makes sense with this song, which yeah. I will say was by far the most overplayed song of 1997. But looking back, it's a pretty great song. I would agree with that. Yeah, it was very overplayed, but maybe it was just... It went on long enough for me not listening to it, but now when I hear it, I get really excited. For a while, there was way too much. I would agree with that. Yeah, it definitely gets you psyched up. I like the message of the song, but I do remember hating it at the time. Now it's been a while. (laughs) I can respect it. And what I didn't realize, and I know that people had said this to me, but what I didn't realize at the time is how punk rock this band is, despite the fact that their music is not punk rock sounding. But when you look into this band, it's amazing. They are more punk than most bands that sound really punk. With the exception of maybe like Rage Against the Machine and Anti-Flag, this band seems like the most, I don't know, socially conscious and controversial band that I have read about. And it's freaking Chumbawamba of all people. They're very politically driven. Uh, I, I I was pretty young when this song came out. I believe I had it on, you know, CD or cassette. Uh, CD? Right. I don't know. Yeah, it'd be CD. It'd be CD at that time. 1997, that's CD. Yeah, but I was (laughs) young, so I didn't get a CD player yet. So I was, like, late to the game with having a CD player because my older sisters did. I would guess that cassettes would have been completely gone by 1997, but that may have been the, yeah. that may have been the very tail end of them. But no, you're probably right. I don't know why I have it in my head that way. Maybe like, I'm not trying, I, I definitely had a lot of cassettes, so maybe I'm just getting it confused right. with something well, else, but it's definitely a very recognizable album cover. It's very so, recognizable. So stupid. It's got like, it's bright green and it's got this face on it and it is just, it's a the purple ugliest baby. cover you can imagine. You, can you imagine. say bright green, but you forget about the purple baby, right? Yes, yeah. There, there's a <laughs> purple baby face on a bright green background. I can't imagine <laughs> when they when they were like, we have the album cover and showed it to the band. They're like, well, that's what we're going with. But that being said, it's very recognizable. So maybe it's Nirvana's album art on L- LSD. That's yeah, what it's pretty I, much. Yeah. I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. But looking into this band's history, before we get into this song, I wouldn't have guessed this band started in 1982 in England. Uh, I wouldn't have guessed that they were part of any punk rock movement. And I wouldn't have guessed that they were super all for animal rights and anti-war movements. Uh, I wouldn't have guessed any of these things based on this song that sings about drinking a whiskey drink and a vodka drink the feeling behind the song somewhat relates to that it's a it's a real go out and get them type of chorus uh, I, I see that but i wouldn't have guessed all of this stuff about chumba wumba of all bands but it's pretty cool they have a giant long career and it's pretty impressive when you look into it and their first full length 
which was called Pictures of Starving Children Sell Records. Uh, they were very critical of Live Aid, which I haven't heard many people be very critical of Live Aid. I'm sure everyone who's listening knows all about Live Aid, uh, which seemed like something that was very good. I would have never looked at the other side of it and, and been critical of the artists and critical of the fact that it was drawing away from the, the political issues that caused the hunger in the first place. I never really thought of it that way. But I do think there's probably a point there. They're definitely political. And it's they talk a lot about like, you know, libertarian and, and very like anarchistic. But it's from like a different point than what I feel like I know now. I, I need to look into it more. But I, I love how like the one song that is about going out and drinking and pissing the night away, which also fun fact, only about eight months ago did it like kick in that they didn't literally mean peeing all night it, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're like that's just like oh i'm pissing the night away I, i'm not kidding i'm that dumb uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but i thought that was really interesting and it does make sense that you know a band who's so politically forward and punk rock does have a song about getting drunk on their record you know that 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 makes sense to me so it's just kind of ironic that it ended up being this like sync television gem that right. it's turned into as well Right. It, it, at any point in any show or movie, there's some point where this song would make sense uh, <laughs> in the story. And just as the band themselves, they say it's, it, you know, they know it's not their most political or even what they think is their best song, but they still like the song a lot because at the time that they wrote it and released it, the band was a mess and they didn't have any direction. And the song was about themselves and their refusal to give up and, and, quit trying so that's pretty cool that it's coming from a real place it's definitely something that people can relate to and the song was absolutely huge it was a huge smash in november of 1997 and and a lot of times you know we look at what was going on at that time this is a little post post boom of grunge and alternative music this is when things maybe started getting a little less cool in the world of you know, whatever you want to call it, alternative music. Uh, when, when you look at the charts at that time, uh, How Do I Live by Leanne Rimes was up there. Uh, you Make Me Wanna by Usher. Candle in the Wind by Elton John. This, this is in that big, long span where the re-release of Candle in the Wind because of the death of Princess Diana was topping the charts, along with I'll Be Missing You by Puff Daddy. That was the time when there were songs about people dying and those were topping the charts. So this was a little bit of a completely other side of the spectrum from those types of songs at that time. So maybe that helped boost it a little bit more too. People were uh, a little tired of being sad, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that, and it's, it's, it's got the alternative feel to it, but it does, it's not a, what alternative music was before. It is a very melodic pop, female, male, you know, back and forth. It's, it's a cool little new wave uh, or old you know however you want to look at it i guess right, but it's right. it, you know, it has like the cake vibe uh or human league it's got that human yeah, league yeah, thing totally. of the, of the, tra- the trade-off between the guy and the girl yeah it, it's kind of refreshing to come after all that but it is interesting it's really cool when you said that they look back at the song and they like it yeah i mean i guess you have to like it when despite the fact they're they're very political and anti-corporate you gotta like the fact that you have a hit song (laughs) that sets you up for life i'm sure this song isn't going this song's still around you know you'll still hear this song at the grocery store (laughs) or something and i feel like it'll be here after us most likely you know you you gotta like that you will hear every once in a while the band doesn't like the hit i got respect for bands that could be like yeah that that set us up you know i we'd all we'd all like to have that hit (laughs) even if yeah even if it's just one of them When, when i look into this band yeah i guess i was considering them like in the alternative scene but Dude, who am I kidding? This is a straight pop song. This was a top 40 on every top 40 radio station song. It is pop, you know? Yeah, I couldn't find where it charted on any alternative. I could only see that it did very well on pop radio and like a top 40 mainstream radio. But right, I, you're more likely to hear it on an alternative station nowadays, I think, than a pop station. But then again, you could hear this anywhere. Yeah, it sort of crosses over wherever. I know they, they were very influenced by like 
the techno and rave culture, which to me seems counterintuitive to punk rock. I know how I was a kid and like love punk rock so much that ravers were the enemy, man. That whole that whole thing, putting Vaseline on your face and yeah. taking whatever weird drug and going in the thumping in the club. Like I was fuck that That's man. But now thing. but now I realize there wasn't too much of a difference there. We were it was both countercultures and though the music was a little different a lot of the ethos was the same between the two. So I don't know who who created that sort of disconnect. We're, although I will say a lot of times with the rave music, you didn't see it, it wasn't live music a lot of times. It was DJs as opposed to, you know, a band up there playing. So that was definitely a major difference. But this band, Chumbawamba, uh, definitely was influenced by the ideas behind punk rock, maybe a lot more than the bands that sounded like what you expect in punk rock they also like you said this song came out in like what 97 yeah. and they started in didn't you say they formed in like 80 1982 which i so, would have never guessed so they weren't kids anymore they probably had that punk rock moment you know right and then like as you grow up you stop hating stuff and you start being like oh yeah you see it from different sides right yeah i'm surprised even their early stuff which <laughs> it's still it's it's always very pop oriented music. I listened to their, their one album from 1986 and I was like, wow, this almost some of their music even sounds for lack of a better word, like <laughs> classic, like, <laughs> I don't know, music from the early 1900s or something or something that you would sing at a pub during a strike. I don't know. What, I don't know what I'm trying to, to say here, but, but uh, if you take a listen, that might makes sense to you <laughs> it's like classic folk is what it is Yeah, classic folk it's like, music yeah. act, like folk music the way we see it is there's too many instruments on stage i have a, a little bit of problem with folk music when you have like 12 people and i i just right <laughs> that sounds more like alternative country or something to me but like if yeah they have that like really like you can clearly hear everything going on folk thing <laughs> it's really R- cool right with with lyrics that uh, have a point they're socially conscious lyrics and uh yeah, yeah this this band was definitely no stranger to controversy when i <laughs> when i looked into them there are there's some crazy stuff about them they caused a lot of controversy even during the release of this giant album really yeah <laughs> i had heard this stuff at the time but reading about it again i'm like oh yeah uh first of all they signed to emi which was a major label which caused a lot of controversy among their fans, but that's whatever. Everyone was a sellout at this time. And in the nineties, that was like the most common thing thrown around. Yeah. You're an artist on a major label. You have sympathy now. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, mean, but I mean, kind you, of sometimes Taylor yeah. Swift, like all these people are like, they don't have, yeah. I don't know. There's a lot going on. Yeah. Maybe not sympathy, but you won't get as much shit as you would yeah, get. <laughs> no, it, was, it was sarcasm. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> but the band responded to that controversy from the fans by saying, even indie labels are completely motivated by profits. Now we can just reach more people with our message, which is the same sort of thing that you would hear later from bands like Anti-Flag or Rage Against the Machine, which makes sense to me. If you have a message and you're trying to reach a lot of people with that message, well, how else are you, are you going to do it? You know, that's that's. It makes sense to me. Might not make sense to everybody. During the height of Tub Thumper, uh, a member of Chumbawamba told a newspaper, nothing can change the fact that we like when cops get killed. <laughs> which Holy is, shit. Which is a, a bold thing to say. And then obviously EMI pressured them to apologize. And they clarified by saying, and I'm, I'm looking at the quote, if you're working class, they don't protect you. When you hear about them, it's in the context of their abuse of power and miscarriages of justice. We don't have a party when cops die. You know we don't. So basically saying like, you know, we stand by the basic message of what we were saying, but we don't actually literally like when they get killed. Is kind of how I think they walked it back, which is how I would have taken it in, in the first place. Cops are not the friend of the punk rock way of mind. You know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of <laughs> of cops myself. I'm not going to say that I hope they get killed, but that kind of goes with the territory of a punk rock state of mind, you know? It's not shocking to me, basically. Well, yeah, punk rock, and then this is like anarchist punk rock. I'm not saying punk rock became safe, but, you know, kind of did. Right. This is when it was still pretty fucking edgy. 
Yeah, nineteen ninety. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> it's like nineteen ninety seven uh, from Chumbawamba. You know, it's crazy yeah. that Chumbawamba, a top forty They're pop band. Rock, yeah. yeah, they were probably the most punk thing out there. Yeah. Okay, we'll go a little further with that. Uh, which this is also really funny. So that same year, they they were on the uh, politically incorrect Bill Maher, and they told their fans that if they can't afford the album. They should go and steal it from the large chains, which led to like the Virgin, the Virgin record stores stocking the album behind the counter. And, uh, you know, that caused a little bit of a controversy, too. That's pretty funny. Uh, I love that, though. Yeah, it's great. A little bit off topic, but I've actually never shot. Have you ever shoplifted? I haven't shoplifted. Uh, I did once. Yeah. I was really young. (laughs) I was on a vacation and I just really wanted one of those. Like I was really young. I wanted like a tropical it's like a five dollar wristband. There's like no way my mom wouldn't have bought it for me. I don't know, but I ended up feeling so bad that I threw it out. Like maybe thirty minutes later, I just put it in the trash. I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always thought that like if I'm gonna shoplift, man, I want to do it from Walmart. <laughs> like fuck Walmart, man. What what do yeah. I care? But then you know. I don't know if this point in my life it's cool to start shoplifting. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> second of all, I'm like, ah, maybe someone who works there is going to get blamed for it. Then I have all these things. I'm like, you know what? I've gone this long without shoplifting. I'm not going to start now. And yeah, uh, you just like five minutes later, you like over here, like a manager getting yelled at by a supervisor about how this is the fourth thing that's been shoplifted in one day, and he gets fired. And you're just like, oh, right. God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want. I don't awful. want that to happen. You know, no. I, you know, fuck Walmart. But at the same time. You know, I don't I don't want to mess up somebody's job. As far as Chumbawamba also, when the, the UK government refused to support the Liverpool dock workers strike, the band changed the lyrics to tub thumping to show support for them. And they poured a jug of water over the UK deputy prime minister who is at the audience of one of their shows. Also pretty punk rock. Wow. Dude. I got to watch some live videos. Yeah, I know. Even further... This is pretty crazy because I can't imagine doing this, especially considering I wear Nikes. But the band turned down a $1.5 million contract for Nike to use their song in the commercials, which is wow. which is wild. That's a lot of that's money. A, that's a big. That's a, yeah. I mean, I don't know exactly why they turned it down. I mean, obviously, it's rare to even find a sneaker company that doesn't use sweatshops and and you know sketchy sorts of labor can go a lot further that can once you start looking into like who makes our phones and stuff i feel like that's something that we all ignore but then if we dig deep into that everybody'd be like oh shit <laughs> what yeah. are we doing you know and and uh so maybe that was part of why chumbawamba didn't accept the 1.5 million but that is that's a massive amount to turn down. But at the same time, 1997, people were still buying records. And who knows? Maybe 1.5 million was a, you know, just a drop in the pan at the time and, and wasn't a big deal. Although I can't even imagine that. That's crazy. I, I think this is one of those one hit wonders. And also, you know, they, at least regionally, you know, over here, huge one hit wonder that. They say one song and you're like set, like one huge song, but that's not really normally true. But with them, it kind of is like, and it's based on stuff like Nike wanting to use it in commercial and like lyrically and like that timeless synchronization of people just always using it. This song probably did gross them that much money mixed with CD sales still being that big. Right. I I can only imagine how much money this band uh, had coming in, but to turn down $1.5 million from Nike is pretty... Well, also 1997, you're still in the height of when record labels would offer bands giant contracts and ridiculous recording budgets. Bands would have a million dollars to record an album. You know, I'll talk to bands now that, you know, have recording budgets of from major labels, even your recording budgets, maybe 30 or 40 grand. Like it's it's changed. Everything has changed. The whole game has changed. We both know that. Everybody knows that. But we're talking about a time when there was a lot of money being thrown around because a lot of people were buying compact discs. <laughs> you know, there were there were three record stores in every mall. Uh, you know, just just packed to the to the brim with twenty dollar CDs. <laughs> you know, and now you can't even give those things away anymore. Ready for a head bangingly good time? dive into the world of heavy metal with the Brutally Delicious podcast. Here, we don't just talk music. 
we welcome you into our heavy metal family. Join us for candid chats with legends and rising stars. We go beyond the typical interviews, exploring raw emotions and the life-altering impact of heavy metal. So whether you're a diehard metalhead or just curious, join our family and let the headbanging begin with the Brutally Delicious Podcast. What's up, everybody? I am Finn McKenty, host of the Punk Rock NBA podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. My podcast is all about doing what you love for a living, and every week I sit down and talk to people who have done exactly that. For example, musicians like Tommy from Between the Buried Me, Matt from Periphery, Lil Lotus and Shinigami, among many others, photographers, artists, designers, YouTubers like Glenn Fricker and Sarah Dietschy, and I unpack exactly how they got to where they are today with the goal of helping you do the same. So if that sounds cool, you can listen and subscribe at SoundTalentMedia.com, and I'll see you there. But I will say that in, in 2002, so five years later, uh, Chumbawamba did accept money from General Motors to use their song, Pass It Along. Okay, this is pretty crazy. The band used the money they got paid from General Motors to fund an anti-corporate activist group called Indie Media, which launched an environmental campaign against General Motors. So they took General Motors money to use their song <laughs> and then used that money against them, which that's pretty fucking punk man <laughs> and this whole time you you just hate this band you're you're like you're you, you hate the song and now you're like going back and this is insane yeah, I, I had no idea any of this was going on with this band i just thought of it as a song yeah i just thought of it as a it was kind of an annoying song at the time just because it, yeah. it was so <laughs> pounded into your head it was, yeah it was just too much yeah but uh you know another thing to keep in mind when we're talking about like them being able to turn down money is so this band has been around since 1982 they have I don't even know. They may have had 10 albums by then. So think about the fact that if, you know, I'm trying to see how many albums they even sold. I know, you know, it, it was huge. It was huge. So, so figure they, if they sold a million or two copies of their album, if even 2% of those people went back and bought the back catalog, think about all that money comes in and that money is through independent record labels. So my guess is there was no lack of, funds for this band <laughs> the band continued after this to release music for another 15 years <laughs> which is wild so you know long ass career man for a band that only had one song that we know <laughs> did you have the cd i did not i did you not, did not. Uh, this song was two pounded in my head and also 1997 when i look back i was listening to primarily ska music in 1997 i i know that is like the high hey, there's trumpets in this song that's true. That is true. <laughs> there are there. Are, I did when I. There could be a cool ska version of this song. Well, yeah. When I <laughs> when I listen back to some of their back catalog, I do see like eh, I could have I could have liked this a little bit. The, one more funny thing about this band in my notes is they hold the record for the longest album title. They beat a Fiona. I'm not sure what the Fiona Apple uh, album title was, but they have a. 156 word album title <laughs> which is now shortened on the streaming sites to just the boy bands have one but i don't know if i want to even do this but i, I might the, the actual title of the album is the boy bands have won and all the copyists and tribute bands and tv talent show producers have won if we allow our culture to be shaped by mimicry whether from lack of ideas or from exaggerated respect you should never try to freeze culture what you can do is recycle that culture take your older brother's hand-me-down jacket and restyle it refashion it to the point where it becomes your own but don't re regurgitate re regurgitate creative history or hold art and music and literature as fixed untouchable and kept under glass the people who try to guard any particular form of music are like the copyists and manufactured bands doing it the worst disservice because the only thing that you can do to music that will damage it is not change it not make it to your own because then it dies then it's over then it's done and the boy bands have won <laughs> that is the name of the album that's pretty awesome and really fun <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know, man. I, the one thing that I pretty vividly remember about Tub Thumper in specific was, you know, that being what I would think, regardless of its chart position, it is probably the most memorable top 40 song of 1997 for me. I remember being at my friend Lucas's for New Year's Eve 
a bunch of friends came and he was one of those friends that had a big house with like a basement where the basement was like its own thing and when you're a teenager and you go to a friend's house where the basement is like separated from the house and you could basically party and be as loud as you want down there did you have a friend who had a house like that or did you have a house like that i had a friend who had a house like that it's pretty awesome man go going to that basement and just doing whatever you want (laughs) and i remember it being new year's eve and i remember for some reason I think that maybe we were watching the Dick Clark rockin' New Year's Eve or whatever was on the TV or maybe the MTV one, whatever it was. I remember that being on and I remember us wrestling. I remember wrestling <laughs> in the basement and I pretty vividly remember my friend Johnny getting an incidental knee to the nose <laughs> and, and possibly I think that's when I, I, I'm pretty sure he got his nose broken and that was at the height of Chumbawamba. And uh, <laughs> that's my personal Chumbawamba memory. Do you have any any personal Chumbawamba related memories from this time? Well, I do remember we played hockey for a long time. This Me, was too, a popular, Me too, man. Me too. This was a popular sports song, I feel like, uh, to a degree. I remember getting grounded because I did something bad. And I just spent the day playing hockey in my room and the song was on repeat and then like two hours went by and my mom was like, get out of the house. Like she, she was like, this wasn't the point of being grounded was to have fun in your room bumping music. She's like, you need to go outside. Like, right. you're, you're annoyed. Yeah. So I remember enjoying the song a lot. I was really young. You got knocked down, but you got back up again. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Whether it was on the ice or whether, <laughs> or whether yeah. it was by your parents or regardless of what it was. I don't think I listened to many other songs on the, on the CD when I had it. You know, I was I was probably eight or nine years old. Right. Hit that repeat button. Do you still do that now? I'll gladly admit that still to this day, probably weekly, I'll hear a new song and I will listen to that song nine or ten times in a row if I like it enough. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's just like when if you re- finish recording a song, you probably listen to it like four or five times because it's the first time you've heard it. And it's just really cool. It's kind of the same. If you ever discover a song that you just like that much, I, I definitely listen to it four or five times in a row without a doubt. Yeah, and then man. I probably have to figure out how to play it. That's the other thing I do. I'm like, okay, now how, how's yeah. it go? You know, and then I got to pick up a guitar and immediately figure it out. So I definitely still do that. Right. This the last song I remember doing that for recently this year anyway, and it's not necessarily a new song. It's like a four or five year old song, but it was new to me because my buddy and bandmate Steve sent it to me, and I'm like, oh my god, this is the best song. Is when am I going to lose you by Local Natives? Do you happen to know that song? I don't off the top of my head, but I live with somebody who you know, that was just like their favorite of all time. So I wouldn't be yeah. surprised if I've, if I've heard it. It's Dude, a great band, though. So good. Such a good song to the point where I remember listening to that song on repeat all day. <laughs> and just like you said, then learned how to play it, listened to covers of it. I'm like, oh, my God, this is just the greatest song. And I definitely ran that song into the ground, but I'm still not sick of it. You know, it's cool when there are songs you could run into the ground and just never get sick of the song is just that good do you have songs like that you've listened to just that you can never get sick of it you know of course yeah uh, poison oak by bright eyes is one of my favorite songs yeah? ever yeah, yeah. that's that's got to be up there uh Tranalanticism by death cab that I, for some reason i can listen to that seven minute song just i can go to the park and read and then i'll just ha- end up listening to that song four times in a row while i'm reading right and then it'll be like <laughs> 25 minutes have gone by and that, like i'm like oh that's a nice that, yeah, I love that song. I get lost in it all the time. Yeah, it's cool when you could get lost in a song. Or those songs, for some reason, you just never get sick of. I think <laughs> the song, the very popular song that I never get sick of is Paramore Ain't It Fun. <laughs> for some oh. reason, something about that song, just every time it's on, no matter what, no matter how many times in a row, I'm always like, hell yeah. <laughs> it just yeah. Feels so good to me, <laughs> but that is not usually the case with the songs that I, you know, I've definitely worn amazing songs out to the point where I can't even listen to them anymore. And that's a shame, man. That's a shame when you do that to a song, but we all do it. You know, I feel like maybe you would know this. There's another like big song the Savage Garden had. I want you that one. I loved that song. I wonder, I don't know what year that came out, but I used to listen to that song on repeat as well i was uh i definitely liked pop music before i got you know i think punk came in fifth sixth grade although i love tom petty the savage garden sing that i wanna wait yeah. dude 
Have you ever seen the video of the soccer hooligans real seriously in a in a English pub singing that song very very like straight faced and so aggressively? Have you ever seen that? <laughs> No, if you could text me that after this, that would be great. <laughs> Dude, I hope, Matt, if you can get a clip of that and put that in here. I'll be your fantasy. I'll be your rope. I'll be your love. Be everything that you need. I'll stand with you on a mountain. I'll want to be. the funniest my buddy tony sent it to me and it is the funniest <laughs> thing the guys are so dead serious and singing that song so aggressively and uh it's definitely i guess it was viral at the time i missed it i missed it when it first happened it's like that local, local native song i missed it when it first happened but then i saw it and i was just like oh my god this is absolutely incredible i think it came back around because on tiktok somebody did like a version of it of themselves like green screen doing it in a bunch of places just themselves it's amazing uh, <laughs> otherwise with this song um this song was kept from the number one spot which is that kind of blows my mind i can't believe this wasn't the number one song but it was kept out of the number one spot by will smith's men in black uh, no so, way that's really funny <laughs> that dude just man will smith so many hits so many man so many. So many, and my, throughout my entire life, the dude has had nonstop hits. That's a that's a damn shame that Chumbawamba never hit number one, despite the long lasting uh, uh, effects of this song after the fact. It peaked at number six on the Hot 100. I guess it was kept out of number one by several songs. I didn't realize it only peaked at number six. Yeah, wow, that's crazy. Like this, My Body by LSG. I don't even know what that is. Um, was number five. My love is the shh by something for the people. I don't know that song either. That was number four. I, I do know how do I live by Leanne Rhymes, which is number three. You make me wanna by Usher. That was number two, and I, I know that song. And then Candle in the Wind. Yeah, the the four and five that were ahead of it. I don't even I don't even know those songs. But yeah, man. So you know, the last thing we like to do before we wrap up on this show is uh, we decide was the song a one hit blunder, meaning you know, this song, some, th this band lucked out. They had this hit and whatever didn't deserve it necessarily. Or was it, or did they bring the one hit thunder? Do I even have to ask it on this one? I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, they seem to have had this, this giant career of putting out music. Uh, they seem to use their popularity for for good, depending on what you define, I would define what they do it as good. It seems like they're very socially conscious and they're they're always trying, you know, spread that message, uh, even if sometimes <laughs> sometimes that ro rubs people the wrong way. Yeah, and whether it's a good message or a bad message, they carried a, a, a heavy message, and that's interesting and cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, you just don't see that a lot uh, with bands anymore. That there's a, a meaning behind the music. And I think that is really cool, right? Uh, no matter what it is, yeah. Well, especially in pop music, anything, but exactly, yeah, yeah, right. It's pretty interesting to stand for something, you know. And and I, dude, I, I'm always thinking about this. And I, I thought about a person the other day, and I could be totally wrong on her. And I think about this all the time, like, fucking, okay. Taylor Swift starting to speak out, you know, like obviously a lot of bad things going on in the world, and sometimes it's hard to even know where to start but so many of these people that ha have such influence don't say anything and i guess it's at at they feel at risk of like losing their audience maybe it's someone advising them don't do that or whatever and i watched that taylor swift documentary where she was like i can't believe i didn't speak out before the 2016 election. I can't believe people were advising her and she didn't want to piss people off. But now she like looks back and she said, that was a huge mistake and I regret that. Now she she speaks out and that was like a major criticism of mine about her. Now I like majorly respect that she speaks out. But now I'm like, we have an election coming up, the most important of our lives for sure. Where is Gwen Stefani? Where is Bruno Mars? Where are these people? And maybe I'm just missing it. But why the fuck 
aren't they saying something? <laughs> you know, there, there's a big long list of people that I could also include. I'm just, those are just a couple examples. And a lot of people are, don't get me wrong. A lot of people use their power and influence to, to say something, but it, it always just is puzzling to me that people are afraid to speak out because they're worried like, oh, that person's a Trump supporter, so they're not going to listen to me anymore. And if I was in that position and I know that maybe I'm not, I'm not everybody, but if I was a, you know, dude in a huge band or a huge artist, I would be like, motherfuckers, go vote. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I'd be speaking out every, sp every step of the way. I don't know. Maybe some people like to stay out of it, but I majorly respect Chumbawamba <laughs> for not being one bit afraid to speak their minds, you know? Not, not only did they speak their minds, but they sang their minds. Right. Uh, the one other song I remember was like Amnesia was on that album. And I remember liking that one a little bit. And like at the end, he just yells like, what about free speech or something? Like right. they like they put it in their music. They're, you know, their one hit that, you know, that we're talking about wasn't necessarily political, but right. th there's plenty of songs on that album that were. And I would be honored to be a part of a cool political song right now, but nobody's really singing about that either. And right. when these guys spoke something, they had, you know, they sang it as well. So you really believed them. It's, it's worth bringing up here that while Tub Thumping was their first big hit in the US, they had a couple hits in the UK leading up to this album with the album they put out prior that was just called Anarchy. And the cover of Anarchy was a close-up shot of a baby being born. But their two big hit singles off of it was a song called Enough is Enough, which was calling for the resignation of their fascist president at the time, and a song called Homophobia about how they're sick and tired of seeing no one do anything when hate crimes happen in the world. Dude, yeah. That, I mean, Chubbawab is pretty badass, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I did mention that I thought they were regional one-hit wonders. I did, Yeah, I did notice that earlier. You know, we, we think of them as a one hit wonder, but they, they're not necessarily over. Yeah. Where, you know where they're from. We should clarify that on, on this podcast because I had somebody call me out. Someone from the UK just today on a post I made about the podcast called out like Delamitri, who's saying roll roll to me, said like, yo, that band had a bunch of hits in the UK. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess this is just one hit wonders in the United States. We should clarify yeah. that. Uh, and, and it'd be pretty cool to talk to somebody who like there was a one hit wonder from the U but like a bunch of hits in the US but they were from like the UK and there was only like that'd be kind of interesting to hear that, like how much their perspective of it too right yeah it's it's a completely different thing Chumbawamba that's pretty badass and you know in the 90s the, I, I did see that I listened to that song there they had the song about homophobia especially in the 90s you still if you watched fucking movies and TV shows and stuff you still saw like passive homophobia like being accepted on a grand scale not that there's not still rampant homophobia it, nowadays but i'm saying like in the 90s it was almost just still commonplace when you watch movies and stuff and you hear people say like homophobic slurs and stuff and you're like oh shit i i just watched i just watched a <laughs> I just watched a movie from 2007 the other day, a Ben Stiller movie called The Heartbreak Kid, where they oh, still, God. it's bad. <laughs> it's obviously it's bad. A bad. It's obviously a bad movie, but I don't that know. That I've why. seen twice. It's a yeah. bad movie I've seen twice. Yes. yes. I, I don't know why I even put it on. It was the middle of the night. I needed something to fall asleep to. And they still had homophobic slurs in it. And there was, def there was even a joke. There was a sexual assault that was used as a joke in it. And that was 2007. That wasn't even that long ago. So, you know, it's good as a culture. We see there's progress always. But my basic point of this whole thing is, is you know, it's great. Chumbawamba was speaking out about that at a time when it, it, it needed it needed to be spoken out about even more. You know, so Chumbawamba, you're pretty badass. If you're listening to this, you weren't really my cup of tea musically <laughs> with this song. And it may have been the fault of just the oversaturation on the radio and stuff. And maybe I just wasn't. I was more at a, a uh, age where I didn't anything that was on the radio wasn't cool to me, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, this band's pretty cool, and uh, you know that that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> and uh, Evan, dude, thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast today and uh, and talking with me about Chumbawamba. This is of course this, is, this has been an absolute pleasure, man. Yeah, a friend four years ago told me that they were putting out like crazy Irish folk music, and I went back and listened to it, and I. 
I kind of, if I'm in the right mood, I, I do not mind listening to some of it. So Hell it's yeah. pretty cool to, to, to hear them change and then to learn that they were around and all you, you provided some awesome stories. So thank you for uh, sharing. Yeah, man. Hell yeah. You tell me all about the trouble you got in. This has been One Hit Thunder. One Hit Thunder is produced by Matt Kelly as part of the Geekscape Network and hosted by Chris Fafalios of the bands Punchline, Pack, and Another Cheetah. This week's guest, Evan Wares, is the lead vocalist of Yellow Bird Mantra. Underneath me, you're hearing the song Beverly off their new EP, New England Weather. Available anywhere music is streamable. Follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Yellow Bird Mantra. Let us know your thoughts on the show by emailing us at onehitthunderpodcast at gmail.com and make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to us on your favorite podcasting apps. Tune in next week for another episode of One Hit Thunder. It's been so long since somebody looked at me like that and you think I'm comforting at times, at night, but... You're listening to the Geekscape Network. Ready for a head-bangingly good time? Dive into the world of heavy metal with the Brutally Delicious Podcast. Here, we don't just talk music. We welcome you into our heavy metal family. Join us for candid chats with legends and rising stars. We go beyond the typical interviews, exploring raw emotions and the life-altering impact of heavy metal. So whether you're a diehard metalhead or just curious, join our family and let the headbanging begin with the Brutally Delicious Podcast. Hey there, I am Johnny Christ from Avenged Sevenfold, and I've got a podcast called Drinks with Johnny you're going to want to check out. I sit down with a bunch of different people from all different walks of life, from professional wrestlers to actors, comedians, fighters, musicians, everything in between. I'm just looking to make some friends and have a good time doing it. So if that sounds like something you're into, go check out Drinks with Johnny, streaming everywhere now.